Yeah, I was planning on talking a little bit, or maybe, about um, the uh, stuff from this week here, week three, assignment three stuff, so, and maybe the assignment two solution, that was kind of, <laughs> maybe go over that too, if anybody wanted to, so. I would love to. <laughs> assignment two? Abs yes. Uh, okay. Uh, I was fine up until I. I'm trying to open right quick. So I, can, so I can take a peek at it. Okay, um, yeah, so I think, uh, don't have anybody else here yet, but it is five minutes past, so, um, so maybe I'll go ahead and talk about some things, but um, those of you that are on, yeah, feel free to, you know, <laughs> ask some questions about specific things, so yeah, maybe since uh, um, it looks like there's a little bit of interest, maybe talk about assignment two, I, I brought that up, we can look at that first, and then maybe talk about week three stuff here as well. So, um, so I think most people that um, had stuff going had, had, had gotten into assignment two. Um, I mean, either people didn't quite get started with it or they, they mostly got um, if they got into it, they mostly have the add and remove items working, and then somewhat understandably, and then the, the union and intersect are a little bit more complicated, but, um, um, yeah, I know, I know the issue I have with that was, I think we're the only two in here, so. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, sure. Um, I, the issue I had with that was, um, uh, I was having, tr I couldn't quite understand how, like, or I'm trying to find it real quick. Uh, how when it puts um when you put S1 dot operator union S2 uh, on test line 318, like that that's when they actually start doing the unions. Sure. I wasn't real I wasn't quite sure how to format that, which let me see if it's let me see if the solution's on here. Yeah, I did put it on here. Um yeah, so that that confused me a little. So, so I guess, so yeah, so, so the, right, the, the tests for the union, yeah, are starting here about 300, I think it's the first one. 
So, oh, do you mean, um, I mean, we're passing in uh, a set as a, to a member function yeah. another set, right? So, but that is. Yeah, I was having, I was having trouble with that. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but, and that's a kind of a powerful thing, but, um, you know, if, if people understand uh, some of the stuff that we talked about last week, so, and, and well, uh, when we talked about classes and structures, so it is like adding a new type. So it's certainly perfectly valid to do stuff like that. So, so to not, I mean, so all the functions, member functions that we had before this were just taking like a simple integer usually as a parameter. But certainly once you define a set, even, even in the definition of the set itself, you can set that as a parameter to come in um, as a function, just like any other parameter, because these are like adding a new data type to the C++ language. So, so you say, yeah, I mean, but, but this, this is a powerful kind of thing. So this allows us to pass in um, another set. Um, and I, I don't know if people kind of um, um, understood this kind of test fixture or not that we had. So uh, this is a, a little thing about unit test frameworks like this. They allow you to set up test fixtures like this. So in this case, we set up just a couple. So all the tests before this, we were just using like a simple one set S to add and remove items into it. Uh, but here to test this, the intersection in union, it's, it's useful to have, well, you have to have two sets at least so that you can test a basic union or basic intercept. So like this, this thing yeah. is, is a test fixture. Um, I mean, and, and all it does is it, it just um, creates what, four or five separate sets. You know, so yeah. these are the items and sets. I, I was, I was getting like the add item part. I just got a little, conf what I, what I had the biggest issue with was like the syntax of how to get the set into the other set, which I see, I see it now. Uh -huh. uh, now that I'm, now that, you know, it's in front of me, but I was, that was definitely where I was confused. Cause I was sitting there for like, wait, one, how do I, how do I set that? Or how do I set that as the parameter? Or how's, how do I put the syntax correctly? And two, um, I mean, just to two, then I was having, yeah, then I couldn't figure out how to like reference it in the actual, uh, or in the actual like function. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. So I think I, I followed you. So, um, yeah. So, I mean, to me, um, in, in class like this or in programming one, two, I mean, half the battle really is if you can kind of figure out the signature of your function. So, I mean, one, you know, lots of people need a lot more practice just on, on functions in general, but, um, but yeah, so um, in this case for the union the intersection, um, they were both supposed to be defined as void functions. So, so yeah, you might've had to have read the assignment description a little yeah. bit closely once you got to this part. Uh, but, but yeah, they're, they're just, they are taking a set um, as the one and only parameter in both cases. So. Um, yeah, and uh, what? Here, go ahead. And um, I, uh, what I, I ended up. Go ahead. <laughs> sorry, go ahead. <laughs> uh, what I ended up doing was like I did. I was able to figure out the void or that it was void, but uh, yeah, instead of putting a constant uh, set, I I was just putting set because I, I didn't understand well, why it needed constant. Okay, well, um, and I didn't take anything off for that, so there was an announcement for. Um, for those of you, or when I, I discussed the assignment too, so maybe I'll discuss that a little bit here as well. Um, I did discuss a little bit about that use of constant um, down here in the uh, in, in my announcement about this assignment. So maybe I'll go over that kind of real quickly. Yeah. So, so this is kind of an important thing. So in in my postal solution, like I said, I mean I didn't didn't take off any points if people didn't have these, uh, but you'll but you guys will see more of this. Um, in the future assignments here. So there was actually two uses of const here. Um, so one, these are known as constant member functions. So when you put const at the end of a function like this, uh, is empty, contains item and string. What that does um, is this. So let's look at like uh, the first one, is empty. So it, 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 often things that are accessor methods that are what are known as getter methods, when you're doing object-oriented programming, all these do is get information um, from a class, and, and that's kind of what 
all of these do. So all three of these, they just get some information, whether the set is empty or not, uh, whether it contains a particular item, true or false, um, and return back um, a string representation. So uh, oh, get size as well. So get size is maybe even is, is a classic getter, um, as the name shows. So all it does is access the, the set size and return that, right? So all, all the constant number function is doing like this is it makes it illegal for you to do something to, to, to modify the object. So it, it's a guarantee that I'm, I'm uh, that calling this function um, doesn't have any side effects, you know, so so set methods like like if we had a corresponding set set size <laughs> a little bit confusing, but, but if we had a method where you could actually set a parameter like the set size, um, those can't be constant because the purpose of setter methods is to actually change something about your instance, your, your class instance, right? But but getter methods or methods that are just meant to access information about the current state of your object. Um, it's, it's good practice if, if you're not actually changing or if you don't want the function to actually modify um, member variables or any state of your class to, to explicitly tell your C++ compiler that it's a constant function like this. And that would, so if I tried to do something like um, make an update to one of my member variables of my class, it, the, the, the compiler wouldn't allow it. So yeah, we're getting a, um, expression must be a modifiable L value, um, which again, not a great uh, error message, but it's really because we declared the, the function to be a constant function that uh, every, everything that's a member variable um, uh, is considered non-modifiable inside of a constant member function like this. So. Um, okay, so you so you'd put con you'd put constant after a function where uh, like if the function is not actually changing anything, right? If it's just giving you information, right? Just okay. informational functions. So the know, classic get fun getter functions are informational functions. So yeah. And uh, what about when you used it in the variables, like on a uh, operator union and operator intersect? You use const. Constant yeah. set, other set. Yeah. Uh, why? Why'd you put constant in front of those? Yes. Look at those. So, um, so what that means when you declare a parameter to be a constant parameter? Um, so here, yeah, the operator union function itself isn't constant because we are actually calculating the union. So we're actually going to be yeah. modifying this object, this instance by, or possibly modifying it by adding in items um, that are the union of this set and the other set. Okay? So here though, um, and, and we talked a little bit about this on assignment two as well, the, the constant before the name of a parameter means that I guarantee that I won't make any changes to that parameter. So uh, in particular, I won't do anything like um, call a method on the other set that would actually modify it like that. Okay, so so some of these methods on a set um, are not constant. So and they're they're meant to do things like uh, to, to actually change the state of the object. So like add item. So uh, by declaring a constant here again, you're saying that I, I just need that parameter's input, but I guarantee that I'm not going to actually modify it. I'm not, I'm not going to be changing its state by okay. calling a method that might do something like add an item to that other set or something like that. So, um, okay, so that makes sure that you can't accidentally modify it. Right, right. So, and again, that's a good thing to do. Okay, so, cool. because again, for this is a common thing to do for user-defined types, uh, but but we also use that for an array for arrays last week. So, if you need an array as an input, or if you need a, yeah. a, a, a an instance of a class or an instance of a structure as an input, but you're not going to modify any of the values or call any methods that actually modify that object, then, then yeah, you should declare it as constant. Okay. It just makes the code safer, you know, and, and it, it adds more information to the user of your function to know that, um, that, that yeah, that function, that, or that object um, doesn't get modified inside of your um, okay. class, inside of your method here, so. Yeah, I, I like that because I'm kind of mad now 
because like I was because now it seems really obvious, but the other night when I was actually trying it, I was struggling. It might have been because it was like one a.m. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I but now it that, seems now it seems really obvious. I think uh, many other languages that are typed languages uh, like Java have similar kinds of things. I can't remember exactly. Um, but um, you'll see similar ideas in, in object-oriented languages that are strongly typed. So uh, you'll be able to do stuff kind of like that as well. So, okay. Um, so I, I have another question. Uh, by, the, by the end of the semester, would we be able to actually make, like, make, all, make all of this? Um, like as, like as in, as in uh, how you've already got the uh, – Hey, you've already got like the program set up, multiple files, uh, oh, referencing uh, each other. Like, I feel like I could, poss I feel yeah, like I could possibly well, do a little bit of it, but sure. Um, um, well, yeah, as we go on in this class, um, um, at some point, I can't remember if I've gotten there's probably at least once or twice where you maybe have to do a class from, um, from scratch, so, so completely with no file given to you. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, okay. late, late, later assignments, uh, yeah, I mean, definitely there'll be some things where I don't even give you, where I don't give you like the signature of the function or things like that, or, or maybe describe, um, um, just what you need to do. And maybe you have to come up with some functions or member functions of your own to, to solve it. So a little bit of that, but, uh, oh, I meant more, or I meant more like, have you, how you have it automatically set up already? Like, will we, would we be able to do to set the um, whole thing up from scratch? No, yeah, all the assignments are going to no. have um, a, a test, or are going to have a set of unit tests. So, yeah, all the assignments do have a set of unit tests and, and kind of a, a specification for you guys to, uh, that you have to pass them, basically, and, and write code that uh, yeah. passes that specification. So, yeah. Because I know, like, one thing when I'm doing them, I find myself a little irritated because, like, I also want to look through the rest of the files that we're not even editing, and I, I'm trying to figure out how those work. Uh -huh. And I and have – because I'm like, okay, he, it, this is already mostly made. How do you make it? Uh -huh. Okay. And, and so for these first assignments, yeah. um, I mean, like, like on this one, really you – all, everything is really just in these and, and the test file. Um, um, yeah. There, there is one more file. There's that main file for if, if you want to start a debugger. But um, but for the most part, really. Um, but but yeah, like you say, you, you're you don't have to um, actually make any modifications to the tests. You just have to uncomment them um, in order to implement these things kind of one by one. So. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, uh, that answers all mine. I actually haven't had a chance to look at uh, assignment three, okay. um, which I, I plan on looking at that either tonight or tomorrow and, or after I get off work. All right. Um, Man, I don't, yeah. I, um, yeah, I, um, I was gonna, let's talk a little bit about that too. There's a couple of other things that I kind of wanted to, um, okay. um, I mean, I'm just going to put it on there because I assume that some people will watch this uh, video after the fact anyway. So um, one thing um, I've, I've come to realize that um, the code style checker uh, plugin, um, the, that I was using, uh, uh, some for some reason has gone away. So um, it's, this this, yeah. this plugin was removed from the market. So what that means is basically, if, if you don't have that, and, and we can um, uh, remove this here, uninstall it. So for people that don't know what a code style checker is, I guess I probably have to close and restart this here. Um, so yeah, if you go down to your extension, so so most people will find um, that you you'll only have the C C plus plus extension unless you install some of your own as well. But but that's the only one that was installed for you guys in this dev box. So without that uncrustify, um, uh, this is a code style checker. So what it does is it automatically um, formats your code to what's known as a style guide, or, or uh, in this case, my 
my personal kind of class style guidelines. So if we have another function, um, and like just put some extraneous space in here. Um, and I'll just put a bunch of um, and put some extra tabs in here. Um, Like that. So anyway, um, th there's certain guidelines. Um, if, if you've ever run across these, um, so these don't affect the ability of the code to compile. But for readability, uh, if you ever work um, in an actual software engineering shop or with a group of people or something, often code style guidelines are defined for your project or whatever. Uh, and that has to do with, with how you indent code and how you place white space, other things like that. So. Um, so this code style checker, if you don't have it installed, um, so what it, it normally is set up to do is to run um, when you save. So it'll actually not only check your style that it conforms to the class style guidelines, but it'll actually um, enforce the style. So it'll reformat some things. It can't do everything, but it'll reformat some things. So anyway, without that, whenever you save, um, you know, your style would just stay the same. Although, um, I'll point out that the Uncrustify tool um, is actually installed and it's part of the build process. So when you do a make submit, um, it actually runs it for you anyway. So, uh, and you can run this by hand from the command line. So if we go to the directory I'm working on, so you can do a make, um, I call it make beautify, um, just to run the style checker. So you, so you can maybe see there, it actually updated it. Um, so, so it ran, um, uh, it enforced the style guidelines. Uh, the, the biggest thing you can see is that it, um, it fixed um, indentation for, in, in it enforce braces on the start and end of lines, um, and it enforced the white space some places. Uh, there's some, I, I, maybe I could fix this. So apparently it's not, I prefer those to have no white space between the, the name of the class and then the colon colon and the name of the function. Oh, it didn't do those there either, so. Um, but that, that's, that's all the, the style checker is doing. And you can do it by hand, uh, like that. So, um, I just bring this up because um, um, so sometimes when I help people out over Zoom or in uh, in person, um, I do kind of want you guys to have your code formatted. It, so it's more readable. So um, if, if you want to have this working um, inside of your own system, um, you know, with this plugin, you can install that um, Uncrustify uh, plugin by hand. Uh, you just have to um, find it in the marketplace and, and download it. So. Um, So if you search for something like Uncrustify VS Code Marketplace or something like that, you should find it. I should probably put a link to this uh, here. So like I said, this is what I had been using uh, last semester. I don't, I haven't been able to find out why, but um, but yeah, he unpublished it, and, and it's, it's a bit strange because Uncrustify is a is a pretty well used. It's not as is. It's not the biggest used um, code style checker uh, and formatter um, for C C plus plus projects. Um, um, but there doesn't seem to be any other plugin for Visual Studio Code that I can find. So um, um, so I'm either going to have to change to a different um, code style checker or um, or try and find out if somebody's working on a replacement for this. But anyway, so you can you can you can download this if you go to, to version and just get the the last one that he had published, which was, you know, again it was it was just in July of, of last year. So and download that. 
and like save it. So by default, it should save to your downloads. So I already downloaded. You'll, you'll get. I totally already downloaded it before. So anyway, you'll get this VSIX file, which is, I guess, is the extension Visual Studio um, extensions um, uh, installation. And you, and you can install it from that file to get the functionality um, on save to 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 format your code and do the style checks. So if you say, oh, you have to um, with your extensions open. Uh, you have to go down here with the the additional kinds of things and, and um, look for install from the VSIX and then navigate to your download of that and then it should install it. So yeah, you can't get it automatically from the marketplace, but uh, but you can install there. And I'm not certain if you have to restart Visual Studio Code. Um, I think yeah. So once once you have it installed, I think immediately it'll, it'll start doing the, the the style checking for you. So notice you should have one space before and after binary operators. There shouldn't be spaces uh, between op uh, between the, the prints there. Um, and parentheses should be indented correctly, two spaces for each level. And so on. So, so again, yeah. If I, if I save that, it'll mostly fix that all up for us and, and uh, get the big kinds of issues. So make certain that indentation is correct and, and white space around operators and, and around parentheses and things um, and so on. So uh, you know, some other kinds of things. So it does enforce that you always have uh, curly braces. So it is syntactically correct to say things like. Um, like that, if you have just a single statement, this part of an if statement, um, uh, technically you don't need the curly braces, uh, but code our, our, our style guideline or class says you should always have those because that, that helps readability and that helps avoid certain classes of bugs that can happen if you don't put those on, even if you have just a single statement. So on, so. Um, Okay, so yeah, that's probably enough. Um, maybe maybe some other time I, I want to talk a little bit more about uh, function documentation and some style issues with those as well. But um, um, just a, kind of a general comment on that though. Make certain that as you go forward on these assignments that the function, the, the implementation of the function should always appear directly below the documentation for the function, okay? So, so if I give you documentation for a function and you were supposed to implement the function, it should be, it should go right underneath the, the documentation for that function. So like the set inter intersection documentation here um, is right above the operator intersect function. So, uh, and later on, you'll probably have to write these yourself. Um, so you do need to have always have documentation of your functions of the same form. So like a, a two or three word short description, um, a couple of, of a sentence or two of longer description, and you have to document all of your input parameters using an at param tag, um, and you have to document the return result. Uh, actually for void functions, it's kind of optional. You don't have to document a void function. Um, you can just leave that out. Um, but um, this is an example of using that returns um, keyword to document the return value. Um, all right. So, oh yeah, another thing that I wanted to kind of show here. Um, um, so moving on kind of, uh, I did want to at least talk a little bit about uh, week three and pointers and dynamic memory allocation. Um, another thing that I want to make certain that people are aware of, let's close these off here, is that um, all of the um, all of the exam code examples that are given for the um, um, 
the video lectures in this class, uh, they are all available as runnable and compilable code under the example subdirectory in our repository. So for example, you know, if you wanted to follow along when you're watching the, the video on pointers this week, you can bring this up. Um, you should have the same code and it should compile and run. So you should be able to hit control, you know, control shift C or do a make. Um, although the, the build system is, um, um, there's no unit tests on this examples. So, and, but you can do it by hand as well from the command line. So if you change the examples, uh, you do a make clean, that will clean everything. And if you just do a make, it actually builds all the examples for all the weeks. Um, there's some of these that have some warnings on there by on purpose. So the compilation doesn't stop on warnings like it does for your, um, some of your assignments, but it'll build everything. Um, just by doing a make. And, and again, you could do that from Visual Studio Code as well. Um, what that means though is that you could then, um, you know, and I encourage you not to, not only to just um, follow along on the videos, but to try some things out yourself as well, you know. So if, if you wanted to try um, um, adding, I don't know, your own pointer, for example. And we'll have an integer with some value, and we'll we'll set z to be pointing to um, um So anyway, so um, just a real quick example of a pointer here, and, and uh, maybe I'll talk a little bit about pointers and dynamic memory um, uh, here in C++. So, um, but yeah, for these these examples, if you want to, you know, you can certainly add code, um, and um, you should be able to save it and and you know do the same thing. That oops, the uh, the Control Shift B to build, or just doing the make from the command line. Um, so in this case, uh, it'll, it'll, again, it'll only rebuild the stuff that's out of, uh, that, that you're making modifications to. So since I just modified the week 031 pointers, that was the only thing that was trying to rebuild here. So um, oh, we got some warnings, um, but um, in this case, it actually did um, um, build the executable. Uh, oh, but oh yeah, um, the other thing though is, is, yeah, like I said, there's no unit test. So if you wanna run this, you either have to, open up your own terminal or, or I mean, you, know, you can always use a terminal um, uh, inside of Visual Studio Code. This is the same as opening up a, a standalone terminal, but you do have to change the correct place, so change the examples. Um, and in this case, you know, they're gonna be called, you might have to look, kind of interpret the, uh, the output of the compilation here, but in this case, this file is, is uh, compiled into an executable called W03-1. So that was our first video example um, from week three here. So you can run it by hand. Um, and there was our output that I just done here. So notice that uh, I pointed Z at, at the memory location for some int value. Uh, but then I actually use a pointer uh, dereferencing to assign a value into it, but that assign that that updates both that, that I mean since z is pointing to some int value, the value get changed no matter how you access it by indirectly by dereferencing the pointer of this pointing to that memory location or by directly getting that value they, they, they both have um, 10 now um, as you can see here. We could change it and rebuild it um, and try rerunning again, for example, just to show that, that you know, the, that, that is the file that we're actually editing and when we're running it, if we make changes to it, we're seeing those um, uh, changes reflected in the code here. So. 
But anyway, so hopefully if you didn't see those before, um, yeah, all these um, um, examples are out there, including for this week. Um, so we talked maybe about 10 minutes about um, assignment three then. So assignment three, there's not a whole lot of stuff with pointers, but, but you do have to do um, some dynamic memory allocation. And it's pretty similar to kind of what's shown with this list type um, in the week three video two here on dynamic memory. So in this case, um, in the example that I had from the video, we have a class that's supposed to encapsulate just a simple list of items. And then we can uh, append items to the end of the list. Um, but it also, um, uh, as I talked about in kind of the announcement about the assignment two, one of the, um, the, the, the downsides that we had on assignment two was that we had a fixed size for our sets because we had um, declared a, a, a variable, um, uh, let me just bring it up real quickly. So if, if you looked on your set.hpp from assignment two, there was this, con this is known as a global constant for the max set size, right? Um, and we had actually used that um, in the class declaration to, to basically create an array of integers of that size. But, but that gave an upper limit of, you know, we could only really handle sets of, of up to 100, 100 integer values, right? Um, and if we uh, if we didn't have any code uh, guarding against you know if if you tried to add more values than that, uh, our implementation of the set would actually crash because you know if, if you go to your um, add item as soon as you add the hundredth item it'll be trying to um, add a value at uh, uh, well, as soon as you add the 101st item, it would try to be adding a value at index 100, which is beyond the size of this fixed size array. So you would actually be corrupting memory um, and potentially crashing or at least having some bugs or something, right? So that was kind of a um, limitation of our, our set here. So for your third assignment, um, we simply use dynamic memory allocation to um, avoid that. And you're going to be doing something pretty similar in assignment three to what we did on the video, the second video for this week. So, so um, instead of having a fixed size for our list, we use an integer pointer, which is going to be the base address of an array of items. And then we, we um, manage it so that this actually grows. Um, so we keep track of what the, what the actual size is of the array and what the actual allocation size is, right? And these can be different, okay? Um, and as, I, as I, I think we talked about in the video, if you look when you append item here, um, so initially we start off with the size of the list of being zero and the allocation size being zero. Um, and we, we start off with item pointing to null. So it's not pointing to actually any array of integers yet, okay? Um, and then in our append item, we, we check that. So if size is, is equal, greater than or equal to the alloc size, that means we don't have enough memory allocated for our current um, item array um, to, um, hold the new value that we're trying to append. And since it initially starts off at zero, zero is gonna be you know, equal to zero. So this will be true. So it will actually um, do this code here to allocate, right? So uh, just to step through this, I, I believe I did do this in the video, but um, what we do is we just add in another increment. So initially the alloc size is zero, we add in the allocation increment, which again is hard coded as a global constant to be 10. So that, that means that our size of our list, the first time we call a pen item is gonna grow from zero to size 10, um, kind of as this little log message says here. And then, then we do this. So we, we allocate a new, a new array of items. We call this new items and we dynamically allocate it. So, so this allocates an array in this case of 10 items since our new alloc size um, is 10 as I'm talking through it here, right? Um, so, so, so now a new item will be pointed to an array that can hold up to 10 integers. 
uh, and then we copy all the values from the current set of items to these new items. So initially there's no items. So in, that, in this case, the current size is zero. So this loop won't, won't um, actually execute the first time we add the first item in here. So, cause there's nothing to, 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 to copy over, right? Um, and then what we do is we actually delete. So after, after we've copied the, the items, we don't need the original allocated array of items um, if we already, if we had some items allocated. So we can use delete. That's, you should always have one delete corresponding to every new when you're doing dynamic memory allocation like this. So here's our new, um, and this is gonna be the corresponding delete um, that'll happen anytime we have to grow our array here. So, um, and then we, we, you know, so when we're done with, with the old one, we can deallocate the, the memory of the old one. And then from then on, we, we just, by setting item equal to new item, now both of these have the same base memory address of that array of integers that we allocated here for new items, right? So now uh, an, an item is the member variable. So now after we're done with this member function, um, item is now going to be actually repointed to the new block of memory, the, the new items that we just allocated here. So. All right. So we have to do something similar for our assignment three. Um, so, and this, this, this code works. So again, uh, after we do this for the very first time, then we, we will add our item. So at that point, the, the actual size will be one because it went from zero to one, but the alloc size is 10 because we allocated enough room to hold 10 values. Okay? So then when we add the next nine values, the size won't be greater than or equal to alloc size. So we won't do any of this code um, for, value, for, for the second, third, fourth, up to the ninth um, item that we add to the, to the array. We'll just go down here. Um, Sorry, down here, we'll just append it to the end of our allocated array. But as soon as size becomes 10, the next time we try to add the 11th item, um, the, the size of 10 will be equal to our alloc size, which is 10. So we'll go in here again and allocate a, a new block of memory of size 20 in this case. And at that point, we will copy over the 10 items that we currently have from the original items to these new items. We will get rid of that old allocation, so we'll delete, you know, that, that'll be the corresponding match to the very first new that we did when the, initially when the um, list was empty. Um, and then we will remember our items as this new block of 20 items, okay? So, and if you don't understand the logic of that, you know, you really should go and, and, and um, um, work through this and, and make certain that you do understand that. Um, so, um, Although, if I remember right, we made it pretty simple for you. Um, so if, um, uh, let me bring up the assignment description real quick for assignment three here. So for assignment three, um, yeah, we're working on this class to represent a large integer. So what we're trying to build, we're trying to build a new data type that can actually hold integers bigger than the standard integer data type, right? So um, uh, as I discussed a little bit in here, I think um, the, the int, the, the standard int is like a 32-bit int or a 64-bit, I think it's 32-bit int. So if you just use an int value, it only uses 32 bits. So that gives it like an upper limit if you're using a signed integer of like this, two billion is like the largest integer, right? So if you need to work with integers bigger than that, you have to go to like a long int, use like a 64-bit int, but that'll also have an upper limit. So if you want to use truly huge integers, you have to do something more like this. You have to represent them uh, instead, of, instead of as a built-in type, you have to use, what we do is we use an array of values to represent, you know, the, the, the ones digits, the tens digits, the hundreds, thousands, and so on. But, but be, because we're using dynamic memory allocation, we can arbitrarily represent as many digits as we want. So if we have integers with hundreds of digits or thousands of digits, uh, in principle, 
this large integer class could handle that because it's representing an integer as an array of, of, of digit values, okay? Um, and then as part of this assignment, we, we, at, we, we work up to building some basic functionality. So the very last thing we work up to is having an add member function so that we can add two of these large integer objects together to come up with a new large integer. So, um, and that's some stuff that I'll, I'll talk about on Wednesday uh, a little bit more. So I just wanted to show kind of this first thing. So um, really, um, I gave you one of the constructors, uh, but you do have to implement a second constructor as your second task here. So let's look at that. So the first thing you do is you have to implement a string member function. So this is pretty similar to the, uh, the string function, although I gave it, a, the, I used a different name, which I should be consistent. I should maybe go back and redo either this assignment or the other assignment. So we're using the same member name for this to, to create a string representation of your object. But um, anyway, it's, it's called two string. This will look pretty similar to what you did um, for assignment two. So you'll want to use like a, a, a an O string um, object to create your string and, and return it back here. So for the second one though, you have to implement uh, a constructor. So just to finish up here, so in, in the assignment three that you're given, close these off here. So let's look at the large integer.hpp. So you are given a constructor and a destructor. Uh, actually, you're given two constructors, uh, but you actually have to build a third one. So a default constructor and a constructor that will construct from an integer. So if you look at the um, the the default constructor, the one that that is called if you don't have any parameters when you build the item or, or when you construct your large integer item, it just constructs an integer with a representation of zero. Okay, so so it creates um, an array that has just a single digit in it, and, and we dynamically allocate that, um, and, and we initialize it to have a value of zero. So so the default is just to create constructed a digit that has a value of zero. Um, so to explain what the, the more complex um, constructor does that I gave you, what it does, um, if we look at the tests, which I think there are some tests of this one. Um, So there was an example of using this. So, so this constructor, if you give it an integer like one, two, three, four, five, the, the, the basic way, the, there's five digits in here um, uh, in this integer that's created. So what we need to do is we need to create an array um, of, of integers of size five and then put these digits in the array. So that's what this constructor is doing um, here, okay? Um, so, you know, no one will go into the details of this, but, but basically this calculation here, given a, an integer um, like this, will give you the result that there was five, actually five digits in there. So that's how we figure out what the number of digits are by calculating the log of the value here and adding one. Um, and then we dynamically allocate an array to be able to hold those digits like we did in our example here. So we're just dynamically allocating an array. And then this here actually puts the, the values in the digits. So what we do though is we hold the zero, the, the 10 to the power of zero, or the one digit, we, we put that into index zero. So it's kind of a little bit reversed here, but, but what, we're, we're, what we're doing here in this loop by doing the, the mod, um, the first time in this loop when we do the mod here, we're going to find that the zeroth, um, the, the ones digits are 10 to the power of zero, has a, has a value of five, that's what this calculation does, and then we put that into digit index zero. So, so think of that as the 10 to the power of zero digit is a five. And then the second time through this loop, uh, so by dividing by this, that kind of 
ch chops off the five and we just have the value one, two, three, four. And then the next time through this loop, when we do this mod, we'll see that we have a four, but that's our tens digit, our 10 to the power of one. So we'll, we'll put the four digit into our digits at index one, okay? So yeah, the way to think of these is, is the, at index zero is our 10 to the zero, or our ones digit of our representation. At index one is our 10 to the power of one, so the 40 here. Uh, index two is gonna be 10 to the power of two, or the hundreds digit, which is 300, and so on. And that's what, that's what this construct that I gave you is doing here, okay? Um, and then just to get you going, because I do have to wrap up here for today, uh, but uh, the constructor that you're supposed to build for task two, um, instead of taking an integer, you're passed in an array of digits and you're supposed to just copy that array of digits uh, into the large integer. So this is supposed to actually represent, you know, uh, this is the zeroth, you know, the, the, the adamant index zero is your 10 to the zero or your ones digit. And this is your tens digits, your hundreds digits. So again, it's kind of reversed. So if you do it to string, you'll see that it reverses it uh, if you correctly um, construct your large integer here. So that's, you know, what, 2,147,483,648. So that's what that represents, okay? So um, this constructor, kind of just to give you the signature, is basically, it means a constructor, so there's no return value. But instead of taking an integer, it's taking an array. Oh, and, and you also have to pass in the size, um, so the number of digits in here. So again, I, I'm sure I had this in the um, assignment description, but if we look at our test here, um, so you're supposed to construct it, you, you give the, the, the number of digits as the first parameter to the constructor, and then the actual array of digits as the second parameter here. So, um, so yeah, you actually need two parameters. Let's call it num digits. And then um, the actual digits as an array of integers, right? So that's kind of what your um, constructor signature would look like, right? And then as far as an implementation, um, so again, I think for this assignment, I gave you the function prototypes for most everything that you need. So you need to put your code at the correct place for the function prototype. Um, you ought to go ahead and remove, whenever I have directives like this, your implementation goes here or whatever, you know, you, sh you shouldn't leave code in to your final production code or your final submissions for assignments that um, doesn't really, um, um, isn't really true, you know. So once you've put your um, implementation um, so like that, so, and so that would be your constructor, okay? Um, but it has a slightly different um, signature than the two constructors that I gave you, right? Uh, and, and then just as a hint um, for how to implement this, this should be a lot simpler uh, than this one. So you already know what the uh, number of digits are. You're given that as a parameter, right? So the very first thing you need to do is, as I'm pretty sure I described, is you know, first you need to dynamically allocate the uh, digits array based on the number of digits here. Oh, uh, although again, be, be careful here. So if you do it like I did it here, if, if you name the parameter the same as the uh, member variable. If that confuses people, that's fine if you say, give it a different name, okay? But like the new digits. But um, if you have it the same name, you will have to use like this to disambiguate, okay? So, so you'd have to be careful here. So you, we didn't have that problem on the one that I gave you because there's no parameter named digits. So we could just directly say digits equals and, and dynamically allocate the array that we need. But, um, um, but, but yeah, here you'd have to do something slightly different or else just give this a different name. Um, right. but, but yeah, anyway, so you just first dynamically allocate that. And then second, you would need to copy the, the values from this parameter that's input into the, the array of digits that you um, just dynamically allocated there, all right? Um, 
Okay, so yeah, I'm gonna have to kind of uh, stop the session here. Uh, but yeah, that, that was kind of getting started on assignment three. So I'll probably pick up, give some more hints on that on Wednesday. Um, but uh, yeah, as usual, hopefully, you know, you should try and get started early on the assignments. Um, so it's good to be looking at it today, uh, at least looking at it, if not getting started on it. Um, and um, so that we can have more specific questions on Wednesday, possibly. Um, okay. Any last minute questions?